Hi, this is Kendrick with worldmedicalschool.org. Uh, we're going to talk about UTI and pyelonephritis. I chose this topic today because it's something that I think a lot of us feel like we know really well, and maybe when it gets down to it, we are missing a few of the details just because we haven't looked at it real closely. Some of the risk factors that are uh, included for urinary tract infections are uh, sexual activity, any type of catheters, basically anything that you put in that area um, in the urethra or um, anywhere in that area is a risk factor. There's also some anatomical abnormalities like uh, vesico, uh, ves vesic vesicourethral uh, reflux, which you'll see this in kids that get uh, UTIs over and over again. They have uh, kind of a... Uh, incompetent valve um, from the ureters down into into the bladder and so really what it is is they come in at a, at a bad angle and so the urine can kind of reflux back back into the ureters. BPH can also cause some obstruction which can help lead to uh, UTIs of course, immunosuppression, diabetes, and pregnancy all can uh, make you more susceptible to UTIs. So the presentation is just like uh, we always talk about. It hurts to pee. you got to go pee a lot. Um, super pubic pain. Sometimes blood in the urine. And if it's going to be a pyelonephritis or something above the bladder, then it, you might get some CVA tenderness. And, uh, and and or flank pain. But a lot of these people just look really sick. So they've got a fever, they're nauseous, they, they just look ill, they feel bad. So you got to think about pyelonephritis because we're going to treat it just a little bit longer, not necessarily with different drugs, but, but in some cases we will. And I'll mention that at the end here when we talk about treatment. Uh, nephrolithiasis can have some of the same symptoms, some of the same pain. It's going to be a little bit different pain in most cases, uh, a sharper, uh, more uh, more abrupt onset probably with nephrolithiasis. STDs will look probably pretty similar. You want to definitely ask about recent sexual activity. Uh, the differences with the STDs on the pelvic exam, you'll get the cervical tenderness. Pelvic inflammatory disease, again, check for cervical tender, tenderness. And uh, you'll get some of the same, same pain that you might get, but the pain is often a little more intense. Acute urethral syndrome, I was going to look this up, and I actually have no idea what this is, I'm sorry. Uh, I, will, I will look it up later and <laughs> probably never tell you, or I'll leave it in the comments. Prostatitis. So this is basically a form of a UTI since the prostate is, is essentially part of the, the GU system. Yeast infections can have a lot of the same symptoms. Look for a, a white discharge and uh, usually a little bit more of a smell. Same with bacterial vaginosis. You, you'll have a discharge and, and a different smell to, uh, to the area. And uh, so those things you'll probably be looking at on the pelvic exam. So diagnosis is usually made mostly off of symptoms. You do get a UA, and if you see leukocyte uh, esterase, uh, increased leukocyte esterase, then you know there's going to be some white blood cells in here, which is pretty uh, sensitive and specific for UTI Nitrites is not very sensitive, but very specific. Increased pH you, you see mostly with just uh, proteus infection, which is a, a fairly uh, small subset of UTIs. It is one of the more common bugs. I guess we should talk about that right here is uh, the major bugs that cause urinary tract infection are uh, E. coli, which accounts for at least 80%, some say up to 95% of all of all UTIs. And then there's Klebsiella and Proteus. And then the 
Um, other one that you talk about is uh, Staph saprophyticus. That's the uh, honeymoon cystitis. A lot of times uh, this is uh, onset of uh, sexual activity that you get the Staph saprophyticus infections. So after UA, you can get uh, microscopic urinalysis uh, where you see greater than five white blood cells per high-powered field and at least one organism per high-powered field. And then you also send some of them off for culture. Now, the, the ones that you're most likely to send off for culture is just if it has a little bit of an abnormal presentation and you want to make sure. Or if you are worried about a complicated UTI where you might need to treat with some different antibiotics. So on to treatment. I've mentioned complicated and uncomplicated a few times. I think we've kind of got an idea of what uh, they are, but basically uncomplicated is usually in healthy women, whereas complicated are in men. So anytime a man has a UTI, you call it complicated. If it involves anything above the bladder, so your uh, ureters or your or your kidneys especially, it's a complicated UTI. And of course we end up calling it pyelonephritis if it's in the kidneys. Uh, pregnancy is uh, a complicated UTI, immunocompromised patients and diabetic patients. So for your uncomplicated, we're going to use uh, Bactrim in a lot of cases, sometimes nitrofurantoin and and sometimes fluoroquinolones. Now, a lot of people think of uh, of like ciprofloxacin as a kind of a go-to for UTI, but the recommendations are saying to kind of hold off on those unless you think there is um, unless you think there is uh, involvement of the upper uh, genitourinary system, or if uh, you have reason to believe that there's resistance to Bactrim or nitrofurantoin. Just because uh, you want to not get too many of these bugs resistant to the quinolones. So, and if it's complicated, usually the same drugs except for uh, you do it for 7 to 14 days. Now, I didn't make a bullet point for this, but for... Um, for pyelonephritis, you are more likely to use um, a quinolone instead of, especially not uh, nitrofurantoin. You can use Bactrim, but the quinolones are first line for pyelonephritis. So, um, in general, we also don't treat we don't treat asymptomatic UTIs or bacteria bacteriuria's, but we do treat them in children in pregnancy. Anytime there's been instrumentation or catheterization, you can treat asymptomatic. Um, if there has been any type of a uh, a surgery like a renal transplant or anything like that, then you can uh, you can treat it even if it's asymptomatic. All right, um, special thanks to James Heilman for his picture of cloudy urine. And if you do want to volunteer, please uh, go to worldmedicalschool.org backslash volunteer. And uh, otherwise, please leave a comment below if there's anything that we missed or that uh, wasn't up to date, please let us know and we'll, we'll get that fixed and improve these for the future. Thanks.